the short-term loan, the Korean government didn't borrow a dime for short-term loan. But look on the short-term loan, the private banks of Korea borrowed 55 billion, and the private company borrowed 26 billion. So who owns the money? The private companies. Go down there, look at the long term in loan. The Korean government only got nine billion. But the private banks took 44 billion and 18 billion. So your money, your tax dollars, your pension are going to private companies in these countries. Now what happens? Let's go down below. You notice that as these companies function, they will send back interest or money to Europe, Japan, US, IMF. They, they funnel it back. What do they use this money that they got for? To buy raw materials. So the United States says to South Korea, I'll, lend you five, I'll give you five billion at 10% interest. Korea takes the five billion and buys the oil back from the United States. <laughs> Buy back the copper and stuff while the United States is stealing it from somebody. Now you see how they get rich. Meanwhile, Korea, everything is humming along. Now for the last 20 or 30 years, Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Japan, and America, and Europe, they all are trading, they all are part of this credit scheme. In other words, if somebody told you tomorrow, turn in all your credit cards, you're going out, right? Because the, the, the agreement was that as long as I will use it as long as we keep going back and forth. But if you pull my credit card, you destroy me. Now, the United States has $3 trillion in debt. The United States owns $3 trillion in treasury notes. $1 trillion, $200 billion is owned by foreigners. If Japan, China, Korea, Japan, China, Germany, pulled their money from the United States, this country would collapse. So in this whole scheme, any one country who pulls something to support, the country collapses. So this country will financially collapse if Japan decides to call in this 333 billion. And Germany says, I want my 200 billion. So what did they do? So Germany, so North Korea, Korea is sending back the money Everything is fine, they're buying the raw materials. The only problem is Asia is beginning to industrialize and become competitive with United States and Europe. They don't want that. So what do you think they're gonna do? What they do, let's look in the upper right hand corner. All of it around July, for some reason, under the market phase, they got it all worked out. First you pull a guy from the car, first you identify him as a black man. You stop him, the next phase you pull him out the car. The fourth phase you beat him to death. They're phases. So the IMF got their phases. Now let's go to the upper right hand corner and you'll see what they call the market phase. They made plenty of money out of Asia, things are humming good, but they are industrializing and becoming too competitive. They're making airplanes and stuff, we gotta stop that development. So what do they do under the market phase? They withdraw the credit from Korea and Asia. They withdraw the loans, they withdraw the stock. They, so in other words, they say to Korea, look, you owe us 70 billion, but we, in this scheme, we allow you to pay four billion a year. But they only can pay four billion as long as they keep getting credit and giving back and forth, right? Like your credit card. You must be able to use the credit card, and when things get tight, you use credit from here to pay this one, right? So this is what these countries do. The United States is in so much debt that they use credit back and forth. In fact, the United States doesn't earn enough in the world market to pay for half of what you got. So for instance, the United States earns enough in a year to pay for a certain amount of oil. It cannot afford the, the other 50% of oil. So what it does, it floats treasury notes. And in these treasury notes that you buy up, they use the treasury note every year to get the money they need to buy the oil. 
So the United States is financing on credit half of everything that comes in this country. This is the biggest credit addict. Korea and these countries are in the same scheme. So what these Europeans did, the English, the, the Amer America, Western Europe, and Japan, they withdrew credit from South Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand. They stopped investing in the stock market. They stopped buying treasury notes. And what happened to the currency? Drop. What happened to their stock market? Drop. And because the currency and stock market drop, and they're no longer giving credit to them, now North Korea cannot finance his debt. So then they say, you're now in default. Somebody comes to you again and say to you, tomorrow, cancel all your credit cards. But you know you need the credit cards to live off of. You're not going to make it. If the world came to the United States tomorrow and said, we buy no more treasury notes, if the United States didn't go to war to get what it wanted, you would, the, the price of gasoline, everything would almost go up four times. So what happened was Korea found itself, as an example, in this acute situation where they can't get any more credit to buy what they need, and they can't afford to pay their debt. So what do the United States and them do? You get no more oil. You get no more wood. You get no more anything. You get nothing. So they cut off the flow of raw materials. It's as if the OPEC said, we're cutting America all off from oil. OK, so they put these Asian countries in this acute crisis. And then they said to them, OK, you owe me. But what I will do is I have a special thing for you. But before I tell you this thing, what do the South Koreans do? What they tried to do to save themselves is they rushed and tried to issue their own bond to raise money. But the people who can afford to buy this bond for them to raise money are the same ones who withdrew it. So nobody would buy the bond. So Korea could not save itself on the international market. So when you see under Korea, it says junk bond status. When Korea went to float the money, the, the, the IMF said, Nobody's taking it was junk bond. So what happened was, you go that, see that big square down the middle? So you got the market phase is when they collapse your economy by withdrawing the money and credit and your currency drop, everything drops. That's why if you're a country and you allow yourself to establish a stock market with currency and you hook into the Wall Street and these stock exchange, they can collapse your country because you agreed to play by these rules. So the United States says, look, I tell you what, because everything you can't afford to pay for this, I'll take it back. I'll buy this industry, I'll take this and this and this, but for a fifth of the value, a sixth of the value, an eighth of the value. In the Vietnam, China, Cuba, a large number of African countries, Iran and Asian countries, no longer are part of this system. They're not part of the loan shark system. That's why they're not going to get caught. And what does the IMF say to you now? It's like I come back and we pull your credit card, and I said, I'm going to take your Mercedes for 5000 but you said the thing is worth fifty, But you can't pay five or nothing. I want your stereo set. It's two hundred dollars. I give you ten. <laughs> so now, United States, they pull out their portfolio. These countries now look at Korea, Malaysia, and them, and everybody's looking at what's the best industry to buy for nothing. So what does the IMF say? Let's look at the IMF private bank bailout, and this is exactly what they do to you each and every time. The squeeze and loan shark. You don't pay the money, I break your leg. <laughs> Let's take a look at number one. Now that you no longer can afford to pay me $50 billion at 5% interest, what I'm going to do is take that $50 billion and I'm going to roll it over and now give you a new loan, but at 10%. Right? Okay. But who owns most of the loan, private or government? But can the private pay back? No. 
So when they roll it over, who did they roll it over and reissue the note to? Who? The government. So the private industries done borrowed up the 100 billion. They can't pay back. So the United States tells the South Korean government, we're going to make you responsible for the 100 billion. So they roll over the loan, twice the interest. But now instead of the private businesses assuming the loan, the government assumes it. Now where's the government going to get the money from to pay back? From who? The tax people, the payers. So in order to pay back the money the private business squandered, the government now is assuming the whole loan. But if you're going to assume the loan, can you equally pay back the loan and provide for your people? OK, before we read this, what do you think is required of the IMF on you? What do you have to do to your education on spending? What you have to do to your building of your public service? What do you have to do with people working? And what you doing with what you're going to do with people's uh, pension? What you going to do with taxes? What you going to do with the subsidy on food and oil? In other words, you saw what happened in Indonesia. The place exploded. You can't tell people they can't have cooking. What would you do if you now had to turn around and spend five dollars a gallon for gas? Three dollars uh, for a loaf of bread. Five dollars for milk. So when the people are sitting there and can't get cooking oil, I mean can't get bread, eggs, the place is going up. And in South Korea, they were able to hold it at this point. Indonesia just exploded. So what do they say now? And now that you're under this tremendous budget, you know that private industry that took the loan? It's now valued, it was valued at 100 billion because they devaluated your currency that now corporation is worth 10 billion. Your Mercedes went from 50,000 the next day to five. And he takes it away. So now the American businesses can go over to these Asian countries and buy up the steel mill and the aluminum and the car factories for a fraction of it. They strip them clean. In all of these economies, the industrial base is squeezed down to nothing. The poverty is skyrocketing and all this. So let's look at what they say. Number one, to fight on South Korea particularly, the financial advisor for the government of South Korea comes from Goldman Sachs Securities. He's going to tell the South Korean, see, they're going to take this money and they're going to give your tax dollars to South Korea. But this guy from Goldman Sachs is going to tell the Korean government how to spend the money. Second, the government regulatory agency, they go and pass the, ministry, the finance ministry, they wipe that out. The regulatory agency is J.P. Morgan Investment Bailout. That's who's running South Korea. Number three, the short-term loans are converted to long-term loans roll over as government bonds with high percent interest guaranteed by the Korean taxpayers. Government deals only with the IMF. Korea was trying to work out something. Japan was trying to come in to save it. Hong Kong was coming in to save it. And China, they tried. But the United States told South Korea, you can't deal with these people. You must deal with us, because if you don't deal with us, how are we going to keep you in the scheme? <laughs> These are the conditions. Now you understand why they got to work in secret and why governments refuse to work with it. Government subsidy on food, fuel, and housing go down. Government civil service, they destroy your civil service. Unemployment, skyrocket. You're the one sitting there with people rioting and trying to burn down the place. That's why the United States historically has made these death squads in each of these countries so that they can kill the people as needed when this scheme blows up on them. No physical improvement of infrastructure. Taxes go up, inflation goes down, close failing banks and companies. Sell domestic banks companies to foreign investors and foreign subsidiaries. 
They own your country. That's the price Korea paid for trying to industrialize and having nothing. Did they think that somebody gonna give them something? Bank and companies must downsize and push up the employment. You must open all domestic markets to all form of foreign investment and imports and the loan money, that money they gave to Korea, where does it go? Loan monies to repay foreign banks and companies. So after they give Korea the, the $10 billion thing, who does it go to bail out? Well, who owns the money? Citibank, Chase, Deutsche Bank of Germany, the Japan. So the money that they take from your IMF, that you took your tax dollars, they give it to the South Korean government, who transfers it back and never left America. So on the book, South Korea owns it, and the taxpayers in South Korea are going to pay by, by dying, but these people do it. It's a bailout. Now, if you look on this page, in the upper left-hand corner, you see one of the reasons why they want to educate you. The IMF fund employs more than 1,000 PhDs. So go up to Harvard, get your PhD in economics, and won't know what, don't, you won't know what's going on. Education is to train you. You go get your PhD from economics, PhD from Harvard or Yale, in economy, many of whom constantly travel the globe looking for trouble in the making. Oh, they're looking for opportunities. How are they going to get bribing your ministers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They issue reports praising both Thailand and South Korea for good, strong macro. Follow the Asian countries. This is the way to do it. Only months before those countries were pleading for and got IMF bailout. So you down the drain. I mean, you, you believe that they came with their suits and their tie, they were white, they had PhDs, and all of the trappings that go along with it. And you fell for it. And it says here, more broadly, South Korea, its department stores packed with high technology goods and shops, shoppers, its government ministries, thick with PhDs from American universities. See, they sold it on. That's why when you put in a new finance minister of Vietnam, said, no, we can't get involved in this scheme. And then the IMF said, the, foreign, the, the new finance minister of Vietnam, he wasn't properly educated. <laughs> he doesn't know about the economics because he didn't go to school here. <laughs> what I'm going to read you here is from an article from Buchanan. And it says, if Rubin had a share of the honor, he'll resign. Now, in order to get more money, in order for the IMF to get more money, it get, they're, they're trying to get Congress to give them a quick 20 billion, your tax dollars. That 20 billion is going to go to South Korea. South Korea, it'll never make South Korea. The 20 billion is going to be put on the books for South Korean government to pay back. But the money is going to be sent to Morgan, Chase, Citibank to bail out the bank. So you know why the bailout is this, right? You understand? The bailout is to bail out American banks. You understand that? So when Prudential, MetLife, Citibank, and the rest of them, they invest in these countries. They make big money. The countries falter. They pull the money. And then what they do? They go to the IMF and say, give the money to them to bail me out. That's what it is. It's a bailout. So now the people, the, the, the senators in, in the United States are saying they don't want to give any more money to bail out these black people. <laughs> so look at what Buchanan say, and I read you two little paragraphs from it to illustrate how the system works. Is it from Buchanan? Buchanan, yeah, he, he's not one of their favorite sons. He beats them up bad. Anyhow, they're talking about this whole IMF scheme. And they're talking about Mexico defaulted. Ruben, who is the Secretary of Treasury at this point. You see? And what they're saying is, had Mexico defaulted, Ruben was history. Wall Street 
had to be bailed out. Well, you know, that's why the loans are there. They, they, they're loans to these IMF, mm -hmm. and then the money comes right back to the banks and the insurance companies. That's what you're bailing out. Where did Ruben get the cash from to pay out the bail, the bailout? Government didn't give it to him. His key resource was the Treasury's $40 billion. This $40 billion is, is in the deposit of the exchange. Stabilization fund. They have a fund in the Treasury Department with $40 billion in it. It's called Exchange Stabilization Fund. Set up in 1933 to stabilize the money. Which Ruben used for the bailout. What about the stabilization fund? The stabilization fund is under the control of the U.S. Treasury. Just a little old bank account sitting on the side. When you want to take money out of here, the secretary of the Treasury writes a check. No authorization from Congress. Nobody knows. All he does is take the money, write the check. He hands it to the President of the United States. Clinton signs it. Boom, 20 billion won. You know where this money came from? Your tax dollars over the last 10 years. So even when Congress does not issue in their, their appropriation the 20 billion to the IMF, right now in Congress, the IMF is trying to get Congress to give 20 billion of your tax dollars to the IMF so the IMF can give it to South Korea to give it back to Citibank. Mm -hmm. Even though Congress won't allocate it, Secretary of Treasury Rubin, rubber stamped by Clinton, they're taking out the money from here. And it, they have no, they don't have to, they don't have to account for it. In other words, they don't have to go any place and ask permission. They set it up so that the Secretary of the Treasury with the President could just spend the money as he wants. That's how they're funding it. This is how your government work when they tell you about welfare, this and welfare. This is, this is, this is how it functions. Big time welfare. Okay. So what we have here basically is an overview of this scheme. You call the IMF and World Bank. What is happening to it? It is slowly disintegrating. And people ask, what you talking about? You have to understand, we have to understand that it was only been put in existence since 1945. It's new. And what were the European using before they had the IMF? Playing colonialism. They didn't need the World Bank and IMF. But because groups of countries are not tapping into it, the bank system gradually runs down. The scheme putters out. Because you need the constant feeding in. And so now many of the Asian countries are now questioning whether they should go back. China, Vietnam are not participating. Iran and those Asian countries are not participating. Many of the African countries are beginning to not participate. And the African countries are now saying that there must be a change. What I want to do as we finish is just tail in on a little bit of Africa, how it touches base. And what I'm going to do is just read you from a few paragraphs from an article from the New York Times, June 7, 1998, and it says, at what cost? And this Bob Herbert, it has a nice name, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, <laughs> and a clever slogan, trade but not aid. But a bill now before Congress is in fact an enormous 
benefits package for the thriving multinational corporations and a threat to the sovereignty of the sub-Saharan nations that sponsors of the bill want to help. You know why, right? You see the scheme. Okay, so they don't, they can't fool you anymore. Anytime you see the IMF and World Bank, and anytime you see something coming out the US government, you know what it's about. The bill now only passed the House in March. This is the bill Clinton took over, where it was introduced and pushed hard by Representative Philip Crane, an Illinois Republican who has referred to some developing African countries and their leaders as retards. <laughs> A spokesman told me on Friday that the congressman had no intent to offend anyone. <laughs> The sponsor of the bill in the Senate, which has yet 